Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for taking time out of this evening to join us for this webinar, which has been hosted by AHD Beef and Lamb. My name is Amy Fawcett and I'm the Midlands Knowledge Exchange Manager for Beef and Lamb within AHDB. I'm delighted to, to, delighted to bring you tonight's webinar, which is on managing lameness in the suckler herd. And our presenter this evening is James Dixon from West Point Farm Vets. James has been working exclusively in a farm animal practice for the past 15 years. He's developed a keen interest in cattle lameness and has an active role working with a team of accredited foot trimmers to deliver the practice's foot trimming and mobility services. He's, he also has a strong interest in the interaction between housing, management and disease in both beef and dairy herds. So the plan of action for this evening is that James will run through his presentation and then there'll be some time for questions and comments at the end. You guys will all stay muted throughout the webinar, but if anybody wants to ask a question, or if you think of anything as we're going through, just type it in the box on the right hand side of your screen um, and we'll pick it up at the end and put those to James. Um, touch wood, there shouldn't be any technical difficulties, but if there is, just bear with us. Um, and without further delay, I will hand over to James. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so uh, the brief tonight was uh, was managing lameness in the circular herb, which um, uh, I'm well aware is a very diverse uh, subject. So lameness obviously in suckler herds is, is not something we see uh, incredibly commonly on an individual animal basis uh, compared to the dairy counterparts, um, but uh, it can still be very damaging um, both financially and uh, in terms of um, things like calving pattern and things like that. So uh, it's an important issue and um, it's something that if we're well prepared for it, we can, uh, there's things we can do to prevent and uh, also to uh, improve our outcomes when lameness does occur. So uh, lameness within a circular herd um, results in a number of uh, detrimental effects. Um, impaired reproductive performance is a big one and, and bulls especially. So we'll talk a bit about bulls towards the end, but um, you know, uh, it's often said that a bull is half of a circular herd and on the, on the foot department, that is very true. Uh, a lame bull is, uh, is not much use to anybody. So we'll talk a bit about bulls, but um, yeah, certainly impaired reproduction is a big impact of lameness. Um, reduced yield, so a, a, a lame cow will not um, produce as much milk as a, a fully mobile one, and therefore you're going to be impacted on calf growth rates. Uh, weight loss and growth rates are impaired in, in, in finishing cattle um, uh, or, uh, or growing cattle, so um, again we're losing gash there. Uh, premature culling, so the loss of a cow because either she didn't get in calf or because she's uh, too lame to keep, is a very expensive business. We've got to either go and replace her or we've got to breed another one and rear it through. And of course the old uh, increased vet and med costs, uh, if you have to fetch uh, the likes of myself out to, to examine um, a lame animal. So uh, the agenda for tonight, we'll talk through um, a few of the common causes of lameness, uh, so how we identify them and what treatments we might want to put in place and whether that's something you can do yourselves or whether you'll need to get help in. Um, a bit about routine foot care, so cows and bulls. Um, I put the role of environment and nutrition in hoof health as a separate thing on here, but actually I think well, um, it will kind of come up as we go along um, more than being a separate section. So I'll touch on it for each of the uh, main causes. We'll touch on on uh, where we can look to prevent them as well as uh, how we identify and treat them. So uh, as we know, there's umpteen different causes of lameness um, in cattle. Uh, I'm going to touch on some of the most common ones, but um, you know, you'll have probably experienced various other different causes. Uh, but these are the things that uh, we see most often, certainly within within the uh, beef sector, um, and the ones that we want to look to uh, identify and treat and hopefully prevent where possible. So trauma and injury is, is a big cause of uh, lameness, uh, especially within the beef herd because uh, you know, big animals moving around uh, uh, generally at a higher speed than, the, than their dairy counterparts. Um, foul in the foot, white lion disease, foreign bodies and stones, Fissures, which could be vertical fissures, which we call sand cracks or horizontal fissures. Uh, overgrown feet, sole ulcers, digital dermatitis, and laminitis. These are all, uh, you know, fairly common causes of lameness within the suckler herd. So we'll go through them uh, on a more individual basis. But um, first of all, uh, just a few tips on um, on what to do when we get a, uh, an animal go lame. Um, you know, obviously the first thing you're going to notice is um, is their impaired mobility, they're going to be favouring a certain foot. Um, 
when we look to treat a, a lame animal, um, giving the correct treatment is, is uh, incredibly important and that relies on an accurate diagnosis. Um, we are only generally able to identify uh, uh, the, the cause of lameness by uh, a thorough inspection of that animal and ideally lifting the affected foot um, or limb so we can have a really good look at it. So the first thing to bear in mind when you get a lame animal and you're thinking what am I going to do with this is actually how am I going to um, how am I going to restrain it? So we need a crush, usually capable of holding the animal and lifting the required foot uh, safely and effectively. Um, obviously, whoever's going to be doing it needs a certain amount of training. So um, it's either going to be a foot trimmer or going to be the vet. Um, but if it's yourselves, um, you know, uh, some basic training on uh, on hoof trimming and, and hoof care is important before you start uh, looking at feet. Because uh, if you don't know what you're looking for or what you might see, then um, it's a lot harder to interpret what you find. Uh, you'll need some basic equipment. Uh, um, you know, it's uh, it's incredibly important when doing these jobs that you've got the right kit there because otherwise you're not going to do the right kind of job. So, uh, a decent set of hoof knives, um, some uh, nippers for uh, taking the ends off. Um, when trying to decide whether it's a foot lameness or whether it's uh, um, an injury to the leg or higher up, perhaps. I find a, uh, a pair of hoof testers are incredibly useful. Um, you can get them quite easily. Uh, they're, they're sold for horses and farrier generally. Um, but you know, just the ability to squeeze uh, the hoof and actually find out if the animal resents that particular area being squeezed is really useful in deciding you know, why they're actually laying. Because it's not always that you can see uh, on the initial inspection. And then some basic supplies for treatment. So. Um, uh, we'll go through various treatments as, as we go along but um, uh, the ability to put a block on uh, on a good claw if there's a, a, a hoof problem um, the ability to obviously spray any uh, lesions and it might be that, that you need some injectable antibiotics and painkillers so uh, you know, set yourself up for, for, for the job correctly in the first place um, will uh, ultimately pay dividends in, uh, in how well you're able to um, go about fixing these cars um, Certainly, if I arrive to see a, a lame animal, uh, the history is very important. Um, and the more I can learn about it before I start, the better chance I've got of, of doing the job correctly. Um, and I think it's worth you guys, if you're looking at them or if you're doing, uh, asking a foot trimmer to come and see a cow, uh, to, to bear this in mind as well. Um, so a lot can be learned before we even examine the, the animal. Um, so you know, think about when did the lameness start? When did you first notice that animal being lame? Um, was it a sudden or gradual onset? Uh, certain conditions are, are, are much more liable to be uh, sudden in onset. So a trauma or an injury will generally uh, happen overnight. Maybe the animal is perfectly fine and then the next minute it's very lame. Uh, certain of the claw horn lesions within the foot will develop more slowly. So you know, uh, uh, how quick did it, did it come on? How severe is it? Has it gone from, uh, from perfectly normal to very, very lame? That, that again informs our uh, our view on what kind of lesion might be in there. Um, and then observe the animal in the field, in the pen, and, and just try to establish you know, which limb is affected. It's, if it's an acute one that's come on very fast and it's very severe, that's usually pretty obvious. You know, there's a certain foot that they just don't want to put down. Um, but if it's more subtle and you're just concerned about that animal, you know, watch it and, and see, you know, is it just one or is it actually affected on more than one limb? Sometimes there's systemic problems. Um, that may affect uh, more than one limb rather than just a certain uh, uh, lameness in one foot. Is it painful when standing or just when walking? Uh, certain joint problems or you know strains and what have you, if it's just stood still, they're very comfortable, but then when they try and move, it can hurt. So, uh, you know, perhaps a shoulder injury or something like that, um, or, a, or a knee injury, they might be able to stand okay, um, but when they start moving, you can see the problem much more. Can you see any swelling anywhere? Or if it's a chronic problem, can you see any any muscle loss? Often, if an animal's uh, uh, had a, a lameness problem for a while, you're, uh, they can be muscle wasted. So, uh, and this can be very rapid actually in cases where there's nerve damage. So, if you see, you know, look for swelling, look for inflammation, but also let's look for uh, any sign of muscles wasting away where, where we might not be using the limb properly. Um, is it worse on a hard or a soft surface? Uh, so. Sometimes, uh, say something like a solar ulcer or a, or, or a, um, a foot abscess 
is uh, more painful on a hard surface. It's done in hard concrete. They really feel it. They, you know, give them a padded surface like a deep bed or something, and the uh, the gait will improve slightly. Uh, conversely, um, a problem higher up, so a shoulder or perhaps a hip injury, um, will be the other way around. They're better on a hard surface, whereas say a lot of deep bedding and it drags. You know, they've got to sort of lift the foot up to to move through the the bedding. Um, they'll actually be more lame um, on that soft surface. So that's a useful one as well in deciding perhaps what the cause is. And it may help to record this information for future reference if it's something that's an ongoing problem. So restraint, um, as I say, it, certainly if we're, we're looking um, to inspect the foot and look for a foot problem, um, but also you know, when we're wanting to examine them to look for other sorts of injury, um, it's really important to restrain the animal properly. And this is one of the biggest challenges with sucklers. Um, quite often we, are, we, might, we may be called out uh, to a lame animal um, in a pen or in, you know, we can get it in a race perhaps, but if we can't lift its foot up and, and actually have a, a good look at it, it's often very hard to accurately diagnose it. And um, it can be um, you know, quite unsatisfying for, for the client and for us if we're um, only able to give them a bit of painkiller and some antibiotic and, and kind of see what happens. So uh, if you can put in place a, a plan to get the foot up at the first instance, then so much the better. You know, it's not always easy. They're, they're big animals. They're often unaccustomed to being handled, certainly in a foot crush. Um, uh, so uh, in an ideal world, we have either a dedicated foot crush to so a, a, a crush that's been designed to lift cow's feet or one, um, certainly some of the, uh, uh, the, the sort of general purpose cattle crushes can be fitted with a winch and, and some foot blocks and what have you uh, to allow them to be used as foot crushes. If uh, you don't have the right um, uh, facilities, then you know, there's lots of professional foot trimmers around the country now. Uh, we've got a team of four of them within the practice. They're all over the place um, and they've all, they will all have a, a good crush that's set up for this job. Uh, they can be found, um, the, the National Association of Cattle Foot Trimmers, the NACFT, uh, has a website which you know you can actually um, put in your your location and it will show you um, how many you know which of their members might be near to you. So uh, if if you want an animal um, restrained, then that's always a good way to go about it. Uh, and those guys will also have the expertise to uh, to um, to get them handled properly and to identify any problems. Uh, the uh, oftentimes people talk about the idea of of sedation, you know, you know, knock a, we're going to knock the bull down and do his feet. Um, that's not an exact science by any stretch of the imagination. And I've often found, you know, you, you might get a quick look at a lame foot, but as soon as you start, you know, causing any real pain to them, that they're going to, the, the uh, adrenaline will uh, will soon work, um, counteract the uh, sedative and they'll start jumping up. So if you want a properly good look at uh, an animal's foot, and especially a bull, then they need to go in a proper crush. Not all sucklers are big, so, um, but uh, they still need putting in a proper foot crush. So this was my old bull crush when I uh, uh, used to work down at head office, and um, but we, we managed to put this little Dexter in there as well one day, and uh, had a good look at her feet too. But um, yeah, even she would have been a handful if I tried lifting her foot up in a race with a bit of rope, and uh, I probably would have got a good kick in. So let's move on to some of these common causes of lameness. So the first and, and the one to always consider is, is trauma and injury. Oftentimes we see uh, an acute lameness, so something um, that comes on uh, seemingly overnight. Um, our first instinct is always to go and look at the foot, but uh, it's worth just remembering that, um, that there can be lots of um, other areas. So there can be strains and, um, and what have you. So uh, it's important just to check over the joints and, um, and the limbs and what have you to make sure there's nothing further up as well as looking at the foot. And uh, these can, you know, calves and young stock and, uh, are quite commonly affected because of course they tear around the field and more likely to put their foot down a hole or run into something, but equally a, a working bull can, can be affected as well. Usually big stock, so cows and bulls, it can be more uh, strains and, and ligament tears and things like that. Um, the stifle joint particularly can be a, a problem, and the shoulder can be a problem, and you know sometimes they'll uh, they'll um, injure the backs as well. So all these will manifest as a as lameness or impaired mobility. Um, 
and, uh, and need to be ruled out as well as looking at the foot. Uh, and obviously this little calf in the bottom right had a had a broken leg um, it's not dead it was just anesthetized so that we could get the cast on nice and square um, and it did uh, jump up and run off afterwards uh, but yeah we needed to have a good thorough inspection of the affected limb and you know looking for swelling looking for pain um, uh, but if we can't find anything then then of course we, should, we need to lift the foot and, uh, and make sure that uh, there's another uh, claw horn lesion or either um, so most cases of trauma, yeah, rest and pain relief uh, are the main treatments in our armory. Of course, certain things will be, will be too severe for that. Um, the size of the animal is a big indicator of, uh, of prognosis, really. You know, a big bull with, a, with an injured stifle or shoulder, you, know, you often it needs a long time to get right, or it may not ever get right, certainly not to get it back into full work. So um, the sooner we can identify what the issue is and the uh, and apply the correct treatment then, then so much the better. Uh, in terms of prevention for these obviously if there's certain things that are uh, predisposing to it so slippery concrete would be the top one you know, um, especially if your if the animals are being served while they're housed then cows and bulls can, can slip and slide um, while they're trying to serve. Um, so grooving concrete is really important um, and uh, you know probably keeping serving animals off things like slats uh, or uneven surfaces as well um, is important out in the field you know it's the obvious things it's it's rabbit holes it's uh, it's um uh, uh, uneven surfaces and what have you and just uh, being sensible about where the stock go but some things are are not necessarily preventable and um they will often still find a way to injure themselves hoof overgrowth um, this is something we probably see more in, in suckler cows than we do in dairy cows, simply because uh, dairy cows are, are often being trimmed regularly. Um, suckler cows, in a lot of cases, if they're not laying, they're not being trimmed, which is which is fair enough. Uh, but hoof overgrowth can be a problem. It can predispose to other causes of lameness, um, or it can it can cause a certain amount of lameness in and of itself if it gets really severe. Uh, you'll all be aware that um, you can turn 20 similarly looking young cows out uh, and uh, at the end of the season some of them will come in with perfect feet and looking absolutely spot on and some will come in starting to show signs of overgrowth and, and regular hoof shape so you know it's not the case that um, just by not trimming all cows feet are going to become overgrown um, there's certain things which will predispose to that so dietary and housing issues um, can be one thing uh, so obviously if, if cattle are exposed to a certain amount of concrete then there's going to be some wear which is good for the hoof angle and also helps develop the digital cushion within the hoof um, so if they're on just deep straw and especially if it's very deep or um, uh, or very mucky then that can uh, there can be excessive horn growth there equally nutritional stresses so acidosis um, uh, or other stresses like that can uh, potentially affect hoof shape and, and angle and we'll, we'll talk a bit about laminitis later in, in, in fat and cattle uh, genetics can also play a role, um, uh, probably more so in the uh, in the perhaps the dairy cross cows. Um, you know, um, it's being bred out slowly but surely, but we certainly had a phase where there was quite a few um, dairy cows coming through with corkscrew claws, and, and obviously if you keep a, a, a beef cross out of the dairy cows to make you a suckler cow, that can um, that can run through into them as well. Um, so those claws kind of uh, twist round as they grow they can be really challenging to trim because the quick doesn't necessarily sit square within the horn so um, uh, they're quite a skillful touch when trimming and um, you, know, you wouldn't want to keep uh, breeding replacements from, from animals that show that trait. Uh, I say most uh, hoof overgrowth if it's just straight overgrowth um, can be alleviated easily by trimming um, and if you have a cow that, that is seemingly uh, predisposed to that then then trim that cow more regularly and you'll, you'll keep on top of it so laminitis um defined as inflection of inflammation sorry of the laminae so the laminae are the uh, the soft tissue which links the hoof wall so the, the horn that grows down the outside of the hoof uh, to the pedal bone the bone that sits within the hoof um and uh yeah this can be either an acute or a chronic uh, uh inflammation so acute meaning uh, rapid onset or chronic meaning over a long period of time. Uh, either way, it can be extremely painful. 
um, and uh, and can result in very severe lameness uh, and often hoof deformity later on because uh, the the, uh, the growth down the outside of the hoof wall is not um, is not even. Uh, in the acute phase, there's kind of a characteristic stance. They're leaning back, trying to keep the uh, keep their weight off of the front of the hoof. Um, and it's most often seen in, in kind of fattening bulls um, on a high concentrate diet, um, and, and it's often blamed on the acidosis, um, uh, you know, and uh, change in human flora, uh, which is brought on by those kinds of diets. Um, so prevention really relies on on maintaining good rumen health. Um, my views on that would be that uh, actually it's not the uh, amount of concentrate you're feeding, but the quality of the fibre. So I would see plenty of, uh, of, of fattening operations where the you know the animals will arrive and go straight onto um, you know ad lib barley or, or or what have you. But the success or failure of that relies on um, on good fibre provision. If you've got ad lib access to good quality uh, scratchy straw, then uh, then then you'll get away with that without too much trouble. Where that uh, provision isn't there or um, and the straw isn't. Um, isn't good quality enough for them to want to take it, that's when we seem to run into trouble. Uh, water is obviously very important as well. I mean, access to plenty of water is uh, important to, to drive that straw intake and to um, keep the rumen buffered. Uh, there's also the potential for using using uh, bicarb or something like that within a diet to actually buffer that acid. But um, yeah, in my experience, you get good water provision and good quality fibre and, um, and that's the, the most important thing. If we get uh, cases of laminitis, then we treat them really with rest, with deep bedding and, and pain relief. But as I said, oftentimes there will be uh, some deformity of the uh, of the hoof as it grows out. Generally, the toes will curl up. And there sort of be a, a buckling of the of the hoof of the um, hoof wall, and, and the toes will curl up. And so, some trimming may be required to uh, to try and straighten that back out. Uh, Another common cause of lameness um, in the septic herd would be foreign bodies and stones. Um, this, uh, these pictures here are from um, one, uh, kind of my, uh, one of my colleagues saw just earlier this week. So she went acutely lame and uh, you can see when, when they pick the foot up, there's nothing particularly obvious there. Um, but uh, within the circle, you can just see the, uh, um, the outline of the foreign body there. And, and um, then the, the other picture shows you the uh, the foreign body itself, which was the shaft of the nail, which was embedded deep within that hoof and obviously incredibly painful. Uh, the foreign body isn't necessarily always still within the foot. Sometimes it can be, you can literally get a, a puncturing. So if we stand on a, a nail stuck up from a pallet or something like that, then um, uh, the nail may not remain within the hoof. It, you just, it punctures in and then comes back out again, but that still can introduce infection into the soft tissue below the hoof. Uh, which will um, then become very painful, um, and as it's got no way of getting out, um, cause a, a, a very uh, severe lameness. Obviously, this sort of problem is only identifiable by by lifting the foot. Um, so, in this case, you could give that animal as many courses of antibiotics as you wanted, and as many doses of painkiller as you wanted. But without picking the foot up and identifying the problem, um, the lameness is not going to resolve, and, and left to its own devices. The infection would track up through and, and burst out uh, above above the hoof, or worst case scenario, uh, track into the pedal bone or, or into the joints. Uh, so, this is a really good example of where getting the foot up and having the ability to get the foot up is really important. Uh, treatment of this is by obviously removing the foreign body. Uh, we're then going to trim around the area where it's gone in to relieve any pus and hopefully allow a, a track out for it to, um, to to continue to escape and drain. Um, and then placing a block on the healthy claw, so which is not weight bearing on the uh, on the um, affected side, um, and uh, probably cover, certainly a dose of anti-inflammatory painkiller would be uh, indicated. And if we are at all um, unsure about the level of drainage we've got and, and about how deep the infection might be, then a course of antibiotics will be indicated here. And here. Foul in the foot is incredibly common, um, especially in young stock, um, and uh, and growing heifers, but you'll see it in cows as well. Um, it's an infection with a bacteria called Fusobacterium, which is ubiquitous. It lives on the skin of the cow, it lives in slurry. Um, you know, you'll find it anywhere, but um, 
it will cause a problem when it gains access to the to the soft tissue and, and that's when it's uh, the skin around the hoof needs to be compromised in some way so um, the classic is obviously when it's wet and damaged so standing in a lot of slurry will compromise that um, uh, will compromise that skin and can allow it in um, equally uh, it's something we often see if a batch of heifers for instance get turned on to um, uh, onto silage aftermath um, and that, that pricking uh, effect of the uh, of the stems um, into the uh, into the skin can set up a bout of foul so uh, the foot is very swollen and very painful so the lameness is very acute so they're generally okay one day and the next day very lame um, there's, a, there's a lot of swelling there um, and there's a sort of a, a, a characteristic smell to it as well you know, if, you, if you pick the foot up and run your finger through it's it's, uh, it's it's pretty smelly, hence it's called foul in the foot, or I think some places in Europe they call it stinky foot. So, um, uh, but the most important thing is, is it's got to be prompt treatment. Um, penicillin, good old fashioned penicillin works perfectly well. So we, we systemic antibiotics, uh, usually a, uh, either a single shot of a long acting preparation or a, or a course of short acting um, will work for most things if they're picked up quick enough. Um, and um, I would always give painkillers as well um, you know, and some inflammatory drugs to, to reduce the swelling and reduce the damage to the tissue. Um, prevention here is, you know, it's kind of, uh, it's environmental really. So, um, you know, keeping yards clean, um, keeping uh, keeping feet clean. And if, uh, if there's an issue with hoof hygiene, then possibly considering a foot bath. Um, but uh, yeah, mainly it's about hygiene and cleanliness. Uh, cell hemorrhage and ulcers, not a classic uh, um, suckler cow lameness, but something that we see quite a lot if um, where cows are kept on cubicles in the winter. Um, and likewise, if bulls are on the cubicles or on concrete a lot while they're serving, um, we can see some really you know, acute and severe bruising. So this is basically a traumatic injury. It's called it's concussion uh, forces down through the foot. Um, uh, pinches are quick down below the horn, which is where the horn is produced. Um, so it can either be localized hemorrhage or it can be right through the whole soul. Um, generally, it's more insidious onset, so they don't go lame overnight. They, they will get gradually worse, and and, uh, and they must will sort of um, um, deteriorate as time goes on. Uh, treatment is is essentially um, just by removing the uh, weight bearing from that area. So uh, a good five step foot trim to remove all the horn from around it, and then a block on the uh, on the good claw to take that area out of wear for at least four weeks. Um, Painkillers are also a really good uh, thing to do. Um, if there's swelling into the heel, into the soft tissue of the heel, then we might need to look at antibiotics because sometimes it, 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 these can get a secondary infection which will track through into the heel bulb and that can be very damaging. Uh, white line disease is uh, presents in a similar way to, to your foreign bodies. Um, but it's caused basically by a weakness in the junction between the sole and wall horn. Um, in mild cases, uh, it's just um, sort of a mild separation, perhaps with some blood staining, uh, similar to the to the sole hemorrhage, but around the white line. But more severely, it can become infected and, and, and a track of pus will run uh, either uh, underneath the hoof horn or it will run up the side and break out the coronary band. Um, treatment again here is, is trimming to drain and relieve that pressure and blocking the sound claw and, and surmounting inflammatories again. Uh, moving uh, on to uh, an infectious cause rather than a, a traumatic cause, digital dermatitis. This is something which is still uh, not too common in, in suckler herds, luckily, um, but uh, very common in the dairy herds. And therefore, um, again, where we're buying replacements in um, from dairy herds, we, we risk importing this disease. It's also common in sheep and um, certainly in certain parts of the country uh, as cod. Um, but the bacteria is the same. So again, if, if we're mixing cattle and sheep, then there's a risk of, of introducing it to the second herd in this way. Um, quite a lot of my guys now that are finishing cattle are experiencing trouble with digital dermatitis where um, they're buying it in with, um, you know, with the stores they buy in. And uh, it sort of runs through the uh, runs through the finishing cattle and can cause quite a lot of lameness. So it's a, it's a, a growing problem, not a reducing problem, unfortunately. Um, it's caused by a bacteria which gets sort of deep down within the in, in the skin at the, at the heel bulb or sometimes at the, around the front on the coronal band and as you can see it's quite a raw quite a painful lesion 
um, and when it gets very chronic, it can form these hairy warts. Um, the main thing to think about with this is it, it's an infectious condition, so it doesn't seem to last long in the environment. Uh, but uh, so infection really is from uh, from animal to animal, um, you know, um, and slurry and, um, and what have you are, are a big issue. So hygiene is very important, but also and more so in my view identifying the affected animal and, um, and treating them quickly. In an ideal world as well, we, we'd isolate them and remove them from the group while we treated them, but so this isn't always practical. But rapid treatment to, to clean up the infected animals and um, uh, it, it is very important. So if you're buying a, a batch of animals in, uh, then it wouldn't be a bad idea to, to check their feet when they arrive or to perhaps run them through a foot bath uh, to, to try and uh, minimise any of these issues. Um, but uh, when you pick up an individual cow or, um, or steer or what have you with this problem, um, you, obviously the identification is, is by looking at the lesion. The most important thing is to clean it as much as possible. Um, I use dry cotton wool just to rub off as much of the, uh, the, the dried um, dead tissue from above the lesion to get down to where the bacteria is and then to give it a really good spray um, with uh, um, with either an antibiotic spray like telemycin we have there or um, I, I use the uh, the product on the left which is a, a non-antibiotic but a very effective um, spray for the dentitis. Um, some people would advocate bandaging them. Um, this works very well as a treatment but the issue is is obviously once you put a bandage on it you need to take it off because after it's been on there for a couple of three days it begins to do more harm than good. So. Uh, in a sucker environment where you're not going to want to get the cow in necessarily again uh, in an ideal world uh, i would just uh, clean and spray uh, so moving on to fissures again a, a more structural problem um, so these can be the vertical or horizontal uh, the, the picture there is of a vertical fissure so these these are basically a defect that grows down from the coronary band if there's been an injury or a trauma in that area and the crack grows down the foot um, it can be purely cosmetic, but if it starts to pinch or trap any um, any of the, the sort of lamin the tissue there, it can be incredibly painful. Um, horizontal fissures are what we often call hardship lines. So um, they tend to be uh, a stress such as carving or illness or something that causes an interruption in horn growth or a bout of laminitis for that matter. Um, and then there's a, there's a crack that's visible around the, uh, around the foot in, you know, if you look at the picture there, they'd be running along the same line as the uh, as the brown lines running left to right. So that would be where your hardship would show up. Um, uh, irrelevant of cause, really. If it's causing lameness, either one of them, the treatment really is is trimming to relieve the pressure. So trying to remove loose horn around the edges that might be pinching anything. Um, and uh, if there's an unaffected claw, putting a block on that one. If there's uh, sort of proud flesh poking through, getting trapped, that will require either either cryotherapy, so freezing it sometimes can help to, to die to it to die back, or um, or bandaging it to uh, again to um, stop that protruding and, uh, and causing pain. Uh, this is not um, sort of something that's designed for for the sucker. This is this is pinching from AHDB dairy, but I'm sure they won't mind. It's a, a really useful foot and claw lesion picture card. So uh, uh, this can be downloaded from the HTV Dairy side of the website, and um, it's a really useful just pictorial view of lots of the causes, you know, primary causes of lameness and what they might look like. So uh, if you're planning on on having a bash at your own sort of foot care side of things, then this is a useful reference to have. But as I mentioned earlier, I'd, I always urge you to get some. To do with the training and you know go on a foot training course if, if you're going to go down that route. Uh, so we've talked about some of the lesions and, and some of the things that can happen to, uh, to in this, within the suckler herd. Uh, so let's have a quick chat about uh, routine foot care. Uh, firstly, cows. Um, any routine hoof care program is the aim is centered around obviously prevention of lameness, uh, maintenance of a good uh, of a good quality hoof and good mobility. But if there is a problem brewing anywhere, you know, we want to identify that rapidly and, and treat it uh, before it becomes severe. Um, I think we, in an ideal world, we generally recommend an annual trim. But um, as I said, I'm aware that there's lots of cows actually which will 
narrowly live their entire lives without having an overgrown foot and without ever going lame. So um, it's, it's sometimes hard to justify within the suck for herd. But um, if, you, if you're not going to do everybody, uh, then I would focus on older cows. I'd focus on anything with overgrown feet um, and, and get those guys trimmed uh, on a regular basis. Um, but as important, if not more important, if you see anything go lame, then, then the more quickly that can be picked up and dealt with, the, the, the better chance you've got of achieving a cure and, um, and not having the impact on, on growth, on, uh, on fertility, and, and obviously on reducing the risk of that animal having to be culled. Uh, on the subject of culling, it, it, we talked about dermatitis. Uh, if, if, there's, if you have that within a herd or within a group, um, and you've got a persistent offender that, you, that, that repeats with something like that, then, then you really got to look to cull her because um, she's uh, providing a, uh, a sort of seat of infection that can uh, infect the rest of them. Um, and again, if you've got a persistently lame cow, um, where, which is always giving you trouble, um, perhaps with something really chronic like a toe necrosis or something like that, um, that, that would probably be on the list for culling as well because, uh, again, fertility is liable to be poor. Um, or there's an increased risk of it being cold, which um, you know is one thing at the end of its lactation period. But uh, if you have to cull something, you know, it's got a, a four or five week old calf on it, then it's um, a much bigger issue for you in terms of how you manage that. So better to be on the front foot with that as well. Bulls, hugely important. Uh, a lame bull will not work to his full potential, may not work at all. Um, even if he's if he's jumping and riding and serving cows, his fertility will be reduced, so his conception rate will come down. You know, we, we aim for a really good bull to perhaps have a conception rate of 70 or 80 percent. So, you know, um, uh, eight cows in calf for every 10 serves. If uh, if he's walking around with a bad foot, even if he seems to be working, that conception rate will come down. If he drops to 60 percent, you know, you may not notice that particularly. You might see it as a slight uh uh, a slightly more spread calving pattern, but you might still get everyone within your time frame. If it drops to 40%, then there will be cows dropping off the end of the calving pattern, not in calf. Um, and uh, you know, that is a, a hugely costly affair uh, to any suckler enterprise. So um, all bulls really would, uh, should release, receive at least an annual MOT, um, MOT trim at least six to eight weeks before mating, such that if there is any problem there, you've got time for it to, to heal and grow out. Um, uh, I've just stuck in brackets there. This is also a pretty good time to do a, to do a fertility check. Um, just up, picked up this afternoon, my first um, first ball of the season that's, uh, that's run with the cows for three months and, and not really got any in calf. So, uh, you know, let's be proactive with that and, and get our feet done and our fertility check before we want to make them rather than uh, dealing with the problems later. Uh, when, cow, when bulls are working, especially if they're working indoors on concrete, especially if on cubicles, um, but equally um, if, they're, if they're working on hard ground with a lot of cows, things like bruising, ulcers and, and white line disease are, are really common um, because of the extra pressure put on those hind feet. So, uh, you know, regular uh, uh, inspections of those can be really useful. And if you're even remotely concerned about the bull's feet, you know, pull him out, give him a rest and, and get his feet looked at. Uh, if at all possible. And so rapid attention to lameness is, is critical in terms of cure rate, it's, it's critical in terms of maintaining his fertility um, and uh, you know don't uh, don't wait and see if he gets better on his own because um, you know certainly if it is a, uh, one of his claw horn lesions then, uh, then he won't, he's only going to go one way. Um, and uh, yeah consider safety with bulls, you know, um, don't uh, be trying to pick a bull's foot up with a bit of rope in the race and, and try and do a good job because A, the, the, the job done probably won't be satisfactory and B, the risk someone getting injured. Um, and uh, if at all possible, use a use a, uh, an, an SCFT registered footman because these guys have gone through regular training and, and check days and, and they know what they're doing. Uh, so in summary, lameness has many uh, causes, many manifestations. Um, the financial impact on a her can be massive, um, especially if the big guy on the right there is affected because he has such an impact on, on, on the success of a suckler enterprise. Um, observe and inspect and, and keep an eye on your stock and, and uh, uh, to identify lameness early because that gives us the best chance of, of curing it. 
and uh, an accurate diagnosis is also really important. Um, and I would urge everyone to, to just think about it, uh, how they look after the feet of, of your herd and uh, have a proactive routine hoof care program either done by yourself or, or, or using your local trimmer um, to, uh, to safeguard the, uh, the hoof health of the herd. And, uh, and that's all from me. So uh, yeah, any questions, um, we'll, we'll look to answer them now. That's great. Thank you very much, James. Um, if anybody's got any questions, if you just want to type them into the box on the side of your screen that says questions, we'll pick them up in a second. Um, just whilst we're waiting for some questions to come through, I'd uh, just like to remind you that there is some information, some information on cattle lameness in our beef disease directory. So you can find that on the BRP section of our website. Right. Let me have a look at these questions. Um, first question. Can cows get digi uh, when out at grass or just when in yards? Um, yeah, they can get it anywhere. Um, it's more common in yards, uh, but certainly they can get it in, uh, out at grass. Again, it relies on exposure to the um, to the bacteria, so uh, either from generally from uh, a herd mate that's, that's carrying it. Uh, but uh, yeah, that can happen because they happen to have stood next to each other. It certainly can happen if you're uh, you know if there's areas around water troughs or areas around feeders in the field where cattle are congregating and there's plenty of potential for it to be transferred there uh, as well as at grass. Okay. Um, when is the best time to get the foot trimmer out as a routine? At housing or just before turnout or different? Uh, uh, so for, for the cows, I would say um, probably after you've weaned them would be a good time. Um, uh, so, you know, to, we, we often in the dairy uh, herds, we do a sort of a drying off trim. So um, at the point when they're going to go and have a rest, uh, get the feet in good health then so that the, any problems have time to be to, to cure and fix themselves before they then have to go through carving and what have you. Um, so what that allows you to do is is get the angle right um, such that they go through the winter uh, correctly and um, and then uh, yeah, they'll, they'll get through carving in as good a fashion as well. So yeah, I'd say weaning would be a good time. Uh, but yeah, pre-turnout would work would work equally well if it fits into your calendar. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, most likely is that um, uh, you know a lot of lameness will occur during the winter. Um, that seems um, so. Having done them uh, earlier on. And giving them a good foot angle and getting them right before then you'll reduce the chances of those uh, problems occurring over the winter okay yeah. and there's no um adverse effects from routinely foot trim and obviously with sheep we say now not to routinely routinely trim that's obviously not the case with with cattle no i mean so the difference between cattle and sheep lameness pretty much all sheep lameness is infectious in nature so uh, the routine trimming was uh is a um is a problem because a uh, the, the sort of trimming side of it wasn't really necessary because they didn't really have mechanical lameness problems. But also, be if if most of your lameness is infectious, then uh, then trimming uh, the entire flock at one point with with one set of shears obviously gives you a fantastic opportunity to spread it around the flock, as does gathering and, and and all the rest of it. Uh, cattle lameness is predominantly still uh, mechanical in nature, so. Um, uh, but that said, if, you, if you've got digital dermatitis within a herd um, and you're treating an animal with digital dermatitis, absolutely, um, you'd want to change your gloves after that. You'd want to clean your knives to avoid passing on to the next ones. Um, so definitely bear that risk in mind, but um, it's much less of a concern within, within cattle than it is in, uh, in sheep. Um, and in terms of adverse effects, yeah, you can, you can cause problems by over trimming. And that's, a, uh, I guess, another reason to, to use an accredited trimmer um, you know, it, it may well be that certain certain that you pick up don't need anything taking off, and, and that's one of the main skills of a good trimmer is picking your foot up and knowing, you know, I just need to take a bit off here or here, but actually I don't need to do a lot with this foot, and then the next one we pick up, uh, you know, needs, needs more work, and the ability to tell the difference is, is very important. Okay. Um... Oh, hang on, we've got just had an influx, just bear with me. Um, we've had a couple of lame calves this spring. Um, a neighbour said it would be from too much clover in the field. I presume they meant something about protein. Is this possible or a myth? Um, it depends on the kind of lameness. If it's individual limb, it's unlikely. It's, yeah, anything that affects um, 
the room and bugs, you know, there's potential for, for a laminitis type issue. That would generally be more of a, of a generalized thing. If it's individual limbs, um, then probably not. But yeah, the reality is, in order to diagnose, you know, as we've mentioned, in order to accurately diagnose lameness in, in any animal, you really want to pick it up and, uh, and have a look at the foot and, and make sure that you've you've come to a diagnosis, you know, looking at the animal itself. So it's, it's kind of hard to say from, from afar. Okay. Um, we're thinking of putting a shed up with slats in, so using no straw. Do you get a lot of trouble with feet if rubber is put on the slats? Uh, no, rub rubberized slats are, uh, are quite common in, um, in certain areas. Uh, the main issue with slats, feet uh, probably less so a concern. Slats can quite often cause uh, more of your sort of injury type things just simply because uh, if things are fighting or bullying or what have you on slats, there's more chance of them getting a foot stuck in a slat and, and, and wrenching a shoulder or pulling a, a knee or something like that. Um, but uh, having rubber on, on that should improve the uh, that side of it and certainly will improve uh, you know the risk of anything like a sole ulcer or, or, um, or white line problems. Um, and obviously the slats uh, will allow slurry to drain through so you generally will get fewer issues with, uh, with infectious uh, lameness as well but um, uh, you know they, they say uh, to avoid slats in, for, for smaller animals simply because of the increased risk of them putting a the foot down or, you know or getting uh, it caught and causing injuries that way. Okay um, any tips on lame suckler cows with rock hard soles that you can't make an impression with a hoof knife and that don't react to hoof testers but it does seem to be a genuine foot problem? Um, I mean, if, if there's no reaction to hoof testers, then then the likelihood is it's not a hoof problem. Um, uh, if they are overgrown and need trimming, and the hoof knife isn't uh, isn't isn't cutting the mustard, then again, you know, look to get a professional trimmer with a with a um, with an electric grinder because they've got uh, um, some seriously they've got uh, there'll be blades on there which will will cut most things. But um, yeah, if 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 it's not reacting to the hoof testers, um, I'd be surprised if it's in the hoof. So, you know, uh, look elsewhere um, would be my advice. Okay. Uh, keep your questions coming in if anybody's got any more. I've just got one for you, James. Have they, um, is there any studies being done on just how much time is lost with regards to fertility um, from calving to conception of lame cows? Um, and um, is it just literally that they don't want to bull because the feet are sore or is it, uh, you know, is there other metabolic problems going on that do they stop cycling or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, this sort of work's been done more obviously in the dairy sphere than the, than the beef sphere. Um, yeah, certainly uh, anything which impacts feed intake and, and body condition um, uh, will uh, will impact fertility from the point of view of, of ovulation and uh, and cyclicity. But actually, um, uh, there is some work using data from the SRUC where they've got a lot of body condition score and lameness data um, because one of the big questions we, we sort of wanted answering amongst the dairy herds was uh, does a lame cow become thin or does a thin cow become lame and and, and it's the latter actually uh, poor body condition is a massive predisposing factor to lameness and it, it's certainly in the dairy sphere because um, of the impact on the on the digital cushion and, uh, and you know so you get increased risk of solar ulcers and white line disease because you haven't got the uh, functioning cushion there so um, it, it's kind of a chicken and egg thing if you're thin you become lame you're certainly not going to sudden then put on more conditions so it, it, it becomes self-perpetuating uh, but yes if, if you're in pain uh, and your feed intake is reduced then then by absolutely as well as the, the pure behavioral issue of not sort of standing for estrus your um, you know the ovarian cyclicity is going to be impaired and fertility is going to be impaired um, from that idea as well and certainly um, with bulls and semen quality, there's there's a huge impact. Um, and it's worth remembering with bulls that um, uh, it takes around 60 days for, for semen to mature and come through the system. So if, if he's lame today, you know um, you've got the impact of, of today where he's not wanting to jump and serve cares, but equally two months down the line, the semen quality is still not going to be there. Um, so uh, it can be a long uh, a long drawn out problem. Okay. Um... Can minerals help sand cracks? If so, which minerals? Um, 
not specifically as i say it's it's main, mainly a uh, um uh, growing down from a, from a defect in that coronary band i mean um th there's certainly minerals which will help hoof health in general um biotin is known to to really help horn quality and will reduce uh white line disease but in terms of other minerals um zinc is known to improve skin quality um uh, and, and sort of resistance so uh, quite often uh, zinc is included to kind of help hoof horn health and uh, and, and certainly the, the resistance of the skin to, to things such as dermatitis is often quoted i don't know how much uh you know proper evidence there is for that um looking at minerals more generally you know the most important thing is is correcting defects so if you if uh, there's a there's a known mineral deficit uh in the particular area you're in then, then that's the thing to look at and um that's best done really by looking at, at soil and um and forage and, and actually understanding what minerals you might be short in and, and counteracting that on a farm specific basis rather than there being a particular mineral which is a panacea for good hoof health okay um, how prevalent is digi within the suckle herd? Is it a growing issue? Uh, prevalence, I, I wouldn't know, um, and I'm not sure anyone knows. Uh, is it growing? Yeah, I'm sure it is. Um, I'm sure it's growing. Certainly, uh, as I said, judging by the number of, um, of uh, the finishing guys which now report uh, uh, a fair few of the um, store beasts they buy in uh, being affected. Um, and of course, what happens is uh, you you know, you buy in a batch of stores, um, the, the, the action of them moving and mixing and all that sort of stuff and diet change stresses them out. And, and uh, if they're carrying anything, it is then uh, it's expressed more uh, severely and they, and they can they can become lame. So, yeah, it, it must be out there. We know that um, it's more prevalent in herds that, uh, that mix with sheep because um, because of the cod uh, and that side of it. Um, and I think there's always a risk, as I said, um, when you when, um uh, buying in, uh, in sort of dairy bred animals, especially if they've lived in the dairy herd for a while, uh, they can be more uh, likely to be carrying it simply because it's it's much more prevalent within the dairies. Um, within the suckler sphere, I think um, uh, its impact will depend on on stress because it seems to sort of express itself more uh, if the animals are under stress, and it will depend on the housing conditions. Um, you know, deep straw yards uh, if they're clean and dry will probably be a lower incidence versus um, if your cubicle housed and, and there's more slurry and, and, and that sort of thing to allow it to spread uh, within the cows. But um, yeah, it's definitely growing. And, and you know, the most important thing really is if, you, if you've got it is to identify the infected animals and, and treat them as quickly as possible. OK, and once treated, is it properly gone or does it lie dormant and, and come back? Yeah, it, dormancy can be a real issue. Um, if you catch them early, treat them aggressively, um, you, you certainly have a, have a better chance of, of curing individual animals, but a certain proportion will become chronically infected, often with a tiny little lesion that you can barely even see. Um, and to the point where it doesn't really cause them to be lame, but they, they, they just they become carriers. Um, and, um, and those can be a real pain. So, you know, we're looking more and more in the dairies, uh, you know, looking at things like blitz therapy, whereby we actually inspect the feet of every animal um, and identify all of the ones with dermatitis and try and treat them all in a wanna uh, to clear it out and you know we can do that by by looking at cows in the pylum so it's obviously much less practical within a you know beef and sector enterprise um, but certainly if, if you identify it within your cows and, and you're doing a routine trimming regime then absolutely try and uh, try and uh, you know get everyone through at once and and um and if, if they've got it you know, even the mildest lesion, give them, a, give them an aggressive treatment. And uh, if you can pick them up for a couple of days afterwards and, and spray again, then so much the better. Okay. Um, what causes a calf to get lure? Now, Emily doesn't know if she spelt that right, and I'm certain I haven't said it right. Um, she means when they get a split between the claw, L-O-U-E-R, lure, lure, do you know that word? Um, between the claws, so, um, yeah, like a, a, an individual growth, basically. Is that what we're talking about? Um, Emily, let us know if that's what you're talking about, but carry on for now, James. <laughs> yeah. Uh, classically, uh, we, where there's um, growths or, or, or splits between the cleats, it's usually um, started as foul. So what happens is you get a foul in the foot, there's a lot of swelling of that interdigital tissue, it then splits um, because of the pressure, um, and that, and that um, you know, and then more bacteria can gain access. So yeah, it's usually fouled in the foot, either uh, an active one or one that's resolved. 
um, and the cause is, is just bacteria, um, fusobacterium, which is a ubiquitous bacteria. It's the same bacteria that causes you know, calf diphtheria. It, it's everywhere in, in sort of slurry and environment. Um, and basically, the problem stems from it uh, it gaining access to the to the skin and the soft tissue, and that's that can be either because it's wet or um, or as I say, because it's been traumatized by something like you know sharp straw or or anything like that. Okay, yeah, that's what Emily was talking about. Thanks for confirming. Have we got any more questions at all, or is that it? Um, I think it looks like that's it. So thank you very much, James, for that great presentation and discussion. We've got some really good questions, and thank you every, thank you to uh, everybody for listening this evening. Uh, I'd just like to remind you all that the presentation has been recorded, and it'll be available on the YouTube channel along with all the other webinars that we've, that we've done. You can have a sift through there um, and have a look. So once again, thank you very much to James. Thank you all for listening, and have a good evening, everybody. Thanks, everyone.